Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Greater Vancouver Zoo's live chat. And joining me is one of my best friends here. Yes, that's right. We have Shuba. Shuba is our blue gold macaw. And she's going to be my little co host today. She's going to talk a little bit if she chooses to. I might be a little hard of hearing if I do turn my head back and forth because I do like to bird too, make sure. She doesn't grab a hold of me because sometimes Shuba can get jealous if I'm holding So you might hear me a little in and out if my head is turning. So what I'm going to discuss with you all today is super senses. So super senses is the following, and we use them as well. So what's this here? It's our nose, right? So that's a sense. So we use that to smell things. If you guys ever smell rotten eggs, pretty smelly, right? So it's a good thing that we can have that sense of smell in case we need to leave the house if there's any kind of leakage, or if you can smell something sweet, if mom's baking brownies, so you want to run downstairs and have some brownies, right? So very important to have this sense of smell. It's also very important for animals too, and we're going to go over that as well, what animals use their sense of smell for. Our next one is touch. Okay, I know it looks like I'm giving you all a high five, but <laughs> it is touch. And we use touch all the time, finding things that are slimy, soft, prickly. I don't know if anyone's touched a hedgehog before, but they're quite spiny and you get prickles. So I'm kind of turned off from always touching our hedgehog that I'm training right now because he kind of just spikes out and he hurts my hand. So that I don't really like. But I like to touch things that are soft. For example, my parrot here, she's very smooth. Her feathers are very smooth. <laughs> she's, right now, Chuba is located on my uh, computer. She's going on my keyboard right now. So she's kind of being a silly bird at the moment. Our next super sense we're going to talk about is the silly picture, but bear with me. We've got taste, okay? You like taste? Chuba likes taste. So you can taste sour things, sweet things, not very good things. I don't know if you guys like broccoli or um, when I was a child, my mom always fed me lentils. Not a very good taste. So this is very important for animals out in the wild. No, we don't want you to have this. Fine, you want that? Okay. She wants to taste. So it's very important out there in the wild because some animals rely on that sense of taste, whether something's really gross or something's really good, and they always want to try to find that. Super sense we're going to discuss is hearing. So what are you guys doing right now? You're listening to me, right? So very good to have a sense of hearing, especially out in the wild. These guys need to hear really well. Like for example, prey animals, right? Rabbits. They need to have a good sense of hearing to look out for predators. I know I'm paying attention to you, YouTube. And then we have our last super sense. We have the sight, right? You all are looking at me right now. You're watching me and Chuba. You're watching Chuba be a little silly. So sight is very important. Prey animals, Chuba's kind of demonstrating it right now. Her eyes are on the side of her head, okay? Prey animals need to have this, their eyes on the side of their head because they are able to see 360 degrees around them, okay? They're not focused on having eyes in the front of their head because their meal isn't going to be running away. It usually stays in one like place, right? Whereas carnivores, they need to have the eyes in the front of their face, okay? Because they need to be able to see straight forward and make sure they catch their prey in time. So I think it's very important. So we have our five super senses, okay, guys? So we have taste, touch, eyes, hearing, and what's the other one? Sight, right? We say sight? Perfect. So our next discussion, part of super senses, is um, biomes. So what biomes are is a region containing plants and animals that live in a unique climate. Okay. So what some examples of biomes are is we have the rainforest, we have the African savanna, the alpine, the desert, grasslands, water areas, we have wetlands, coral reefs. Those are biomes. Okay, so it's basically their habitat. It's their ecosystem they live in. Chuva here, she, if she was um, 
her, uh, the parrots for her in the wild are located in South or Central America. So you would find them more around Brazil. So that's her biome. So she'd be in that kind of climate. Lions, African lions, think about them. Where would they be situated in the wild? They'd be in the savanna, right? African savanna. So that's where they'd be located. <laughs> All right, everyone. So our next discussion is to go back to, our, no, you can't have that, to one of our animals here. This is the great horned owl, okay? So the great horned owl, they use their eyes. They have such big eyes to collect all the light they, while they nighttime hunt, okay? They will only do it in the nighttime when they're hunting. And if we had eyes as large as these owls, they would be the size of grapefruits. While the eyes cannot move in their sockets, an, an owl can turn its head 180 degrees to see a person. So that's really important. Now, another important super catch for these owls is their ears. Now, can you guys see in the picture where their ears are located? So you guys are pointing or looking right here with the tufts. That's not actually their ear. Okay? It is their threat display. All right, just to make them more scary. So that's not the ears of the owl. Okay? So the top of their head, their ears are located, but it's not these guys, okay? So they need to hear because it helps aid them in locating their prey. And they can also channel sounds. So that's very important that these guys use their eyes and their ears to help survive in their habitat. Okay? So our next animal we're going to discuss. Sorry, Chuba. Would you like this? No? Okay, she doesn't want that. Whose favorite animal is this? Raise your hands. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah, giraffes. So we have two Rothschild giraffes at the Greater Vancouver Zoo named Pompey and Jenga. Raise your hands if you've seen those guys before. <laughs> very good. Well, they're doing very well at the zoo right now. We're doing a lot of enrichment for them, so they're being very well taken care of. And the biome, you would find giraffes is in the savanna. Okay, so the African savanna or the grasslands, okay, that's where these guys would be located in their habitat. So giraffes, they will use, out of all their five super senses to survive, they're going to use their eyes and they're going to use their hearing the most, okay? Now, why do you think they need to use their eyes? Well, their eyes can see about 1.6 kilometers away. Now, the eyes keep tabs on other giraffes and also locates predators. So if you guys were a prey animal, I suggest being friends with this giraffe. They are called the African Watchtowers of the Savannah. There's a reason that they're called that, because if they see a lion lurking into the grassland in the bushes, then they're running. It alerts all the other prey animals, so they will start running with that giraffe to make sure that they don't get caught by a predator. So they're really quite a nice friend to have. Another one, as we talked about, is the hearing. And they can hear subsonic sounds. And that also helps them to communicate with each other and to locate predators too. Drafts are really cool. They can standing up. They take, everyone has heard about cat naps. Well, here at the zoo, we like to joke around and say giraffe naps. <laughs> so they do sleep stand up because they need to be always on guard in case of predators nearby. What's really cool, everyone, is at our zoo, our two giraffes actually sit down in their enclosure. You would not see a giraffe sit down in an enclosure or out in the wild because they do not want to get eaten. So they always need to be standing up just so they have time to run away. But you can tell that our giraffes at the zoo are really quite comfortable when you see them cross-legged lying down in their enclosure. It's really remarkable to see. Next animal we're going to talk about. Everybody knows this guy. Raise your hand if you have seen our male lion before. Yeah, cool. So we have Boomer. 
and our two lionesses, Mally and Callie, at the zoo. And Boomer actually used to be somebody's pet lion. Yeah, it's not a good idea to have a lion as a pet. These guys can get up to 400 pounds. They're extraordinary carnivores. They're at the top of the African savanna food chain. So they're apex predators. All they eat is meat and they can eat about 60 pounds of meat in one sitting. So I do not recommend ever having a lion as a pet. We stick with our cats and dogs, okay? Oh, it is very illegal as well. We don't wanna own these guys. We wanna keep them out in the wild. Our two girls were born at the zoo. So that's how we got our two lionesses, Mally and Callie. Now these guys in the wild, they're located in the African savanna. That's their biome. And they're super sensitive. Now they're gonna use three major super senses. Remember, they all have five, but they're gonna be using more of their super senses with their three. So their first one is gonna be their eyes. They can have six times stronger nighttime vision. In the daytime, they're not gonna be hunting. They're gonna be sleeping about 21 hours a day because it's super hot and they prefer to hunt at night when it's a lot cooler. Now, I, what I want you guys to do is thumbs up if you think that the girl lions hunt or thumbs down if you think the boy lion hunts. Which one? <laughs> All right, cool. So for everyone who did the thumbs up, you are right. So it's the girls that do about 90% of the hunting because this boy lion here, he has a big mane. Okay, the girls do not have a mane. So imagine yourself running in the hottest weather with your parka on, with like your winter coat. You're gonna be sweating, right? It gets quite heavy. It's the same with him. We're not saying these guys don't hunt. Of course they can hunt, but they have to stay back and protect their pride, protect their territory from other male lions and protect their cubs. While the females, they hunt in a big pack and they, take, they can take down even a small elephant. So that's how they're gonna hunt with their eyes, six times stronger nighttime vision. And also we talked about touch, right? Their touch is their whiskers. So it helps them navigate through small holes. It helps them find out if there's anything nearby, if they're lying down on the ground sleeping and a little mouse runs by and brushes their whiskers. It's going to alert them and they're going to know and then they're going to eat that mouse. So that is their sense of touch. Their hearing is another one. Their hearing is five times stronger. So they can swivel their ears back and forth and they can pinpoint where their sound is coming from. They can like it helps them communicate with each other. So if the male lion is looking for his female, they've been gone for a while, he will roar and he can roar about five kilometers away and the females will pick that up and communicate back. Same at our zoo. We don't have five kilometers away from each other with our lions, but sometimes our male lion, he will roar just to have the girls near him and you'll see them roar back to communicate that they're close by. It's quite interesting. All right, our next one is our final animal I'm gonna show you, we do have at the zoo as well, is this guy. Raise your hand if you know what this guy is. Perfect. This is a ring-tailed lemur. So we've got uh, Nova and Luna at the zoo, and they live in the scrub forest, in the tropical rainforest, in warm temperatures. That's where their biome is, okay? And their super senses they're going to use is their smell. Now their smell, they have a long nose with wide nostrils, and it allows them to smell a great distance. There's two important reasons why they use this sense of smell. One is to find food, and two is to track also the smell. Right, track each other's smell, Chuba. Oops, come close. <laughs> so they also will use it to smell each other. They know their family, so that's important. And their hearing is another important one as well. So they hear to communicate with their family, but just so you know, their eyesight is not very strong. So they do not see color. 
mostly they're active at night. So they'll see low lighting in the nighttime. So they'll mostly be more active. So they're almost like a nocturnal animal. <laughs> we have Chiva being silly again. <laughs> All right, everyone. So as a recap, our five super senses, we have <laughs> touch, taste, smell, eyesight, and hearing. All right. That is our five yeah. super senses. And Chuba is also typing on the board right now. I can see her. There's a lot of zeros happening. She was typing to you guys her questions or answers. <laughs> now, a little oh, fun fact uh, about Chuba here is Chuba is 15 years old. Now, she was not from the wild because we are a accredited zoo. So we don't obtain animals from the wild unless intervention is absolutely necessary. So she actually was born here in an incubator. And an incubator is a really big machine that rotates eggs and gives them the constant temperature so that she hatches. Because you know, with a female bird, they need to be sitting on that egg and make sure that it's warm all the time. But in an incubator, they're always gonna have the same heat regulated all the time. So that's how Chuba was born. And we did have parrots way back in the zoo. Her parents were here, but they got really sick. So Chuva is the last blue and gold macaw we have here at the zoo. These birds can live approximately 50 to 80 years. So that's a long time. So a lot of people do have these types of birds as pets, but we would always say do your research and before you get one of these birds because they are a lot of work, everyone. So for example, if you have a dog or cat at home, you can entertain them, you train them, they know how to be quiet. This bird doesn't, isn't quiet. So she likes to be with her person. She will bond with people, but if you leave her for too long, she will start to scream and it's really loud. So you gotta make sure you know what you're in for because they can live also a very long time. So it's a lot of work. She eats a uh, bird seed. She eats various fruits and vegetables. And if she's a good girl, which she's eyeing right now, she will get a reward. Now this is a nut and she's coming over. <laughs> and Chuva does talk. She has various, uh, various species, species that she does do. She'll say hi, she'll say bye-bye. She'll say her name Chuva, but this to her is a cracker. Okay, so she'll say cracker and this is what she means. So I'm gonna get Chuva back up on her chair because I don't want her that close to me. And I'm gonna just turn the ca uh, camera just so you guys can see her get the neck. And we have to give it to her very carefully, okay? That beak is very sharp. So Chuva nut, there you go. She's gonna walk away from that. What she's going to do, I might have to speak a little bit because I know when I turn the computer, it's hard to hear. We're just going to watch her crack open that nut, okay? But she'll find the, like, the soft spot, the weak spot in the nut, and then take one bite and it'll split open. And then she'll use her feet and she'll hold onto the nut. Oh, there she goes. All right, so she found the nut inside and right now she's just kind of nibbling on the nut. And uh, what's really, really cool about Chuva is she has a blue, uh, a purplish bluish color of a tongue. And scientists believe that's to prevent a sunburn from happening because their mouth is always open. And that applies to giraffes as well. So giraffes have that really long tongue. And for an adult, from your fingertips down to your elbow, a giraffe's tongue is about 46 centimeters long. And so what they do is they have that tongue, they stretch out, they wrap around a tree branch, 
and they rip off all those leaves to eat. So their tongue is constantly sticking out all the time. So scientists believe the reason they have that color is to prevent them from getting a sunburn. Because if you guys were to stick your tongue out all the time outside when it's really hot, do you think your tongue will get a sunburn eventually? I think it might. I think it might. But don't try that. <laughs> Okay, everyone, so that is our little lesson today about our five super senses, touch, taste, hearing, eyesight, and smell. And of course, biomes, your African savannas, your temperate forests, your rainforests, remember all that, okay? If you guys have any questions, let me know, or if anything about the zoo or Chuva, I will try my best to answer them. We don't have all the answers, but I will try my best. All right. So if you want to raise your hand, I will direct any questions. So we have Theo has a question. I've Go ahead, Theo. Seen, I've seen giraffes. You've seen the giraffes? No, I mean, I like seeing them. You like seeing them. Well, that's really good. What's your favorite thing about the giraffe? The long tongue. The long tongue, very cool. I really like how tall they are. I think that's pretty cool. Our drafts are pretty tall. All right, buddy, thank you for your question. I'm gonna go to somebody else now, okay? Okay. All right, so who else has a question? Raise your hand so I can click your box. Um, all right. Okay, Judah, is it Judah? Why? Lion have mane. Sorry, cut out. Why does a lion have a mane? Yeah. yeah. Why does the male lion have a mane? Well, the male lion has a mane, so it makes him look bigger. So the bigger the mane, the more powerful and majestic he's going to look against other male lions. Because some male lions don't have the biggest, bushiest manes. They're all different in sizes. So it makes them look a lot larger. And it also protects their neck. So when another male lion jumps on them and is fighting, that mane is so thick that they will have their neck protected by it. So that's why. Whoa. I know. It's pretty great. Thanks, buddy. Okay, we're gonna go to the next child. Let's see. Um, can parrots lay eggs as big as chickens or bigger? Yeah, parrots do lay eggs, actually. Um, it's pretty close to the size of a chicken egg. Um, it depends on the type of parrot species. So one of the largest uh, parrot eggs that has been laid, I can't say their species name properly, but they are going extinct in the wild. It's that really big blue parrot. It's all blue. I'm sure you guys may have heard of it. Um, it's from that cartoon movie Rio. So it's that type of bird. Yeah. So they lay like they're one of the biggest like egg layers that they do. But for chuva species, uh, it's pretty much close to a chicken egg, sometimes a little smaller, depends on the bird. Chuva here actually is a lot smaller than um, she should be. So there are different types of sizes in parrots. Like some female macaws can be a lot bigger, but chuva came out to being a smaller female. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Who's next? How do you, why do parrots have all different colors of feathers? Why do parrots have all different kinds of feathers? That's a good question. So chuva here, I'm just going to turn for a second. Yes. So their colors help them camouflage in their environment. Okay. So it's really hard to picture. I know blue, gold, a little bit of green on top, but I've put Chuva in a tree before and she's disappeared on me. Like think of putting her in a tree, it's all green and out in the wild, they will hide around like areas in the tree where there's fruits and nuts and they blend into their habitat that way. And also the blue coloring helps them in the sky because their predators are gonna be birds of prey. So they wanna make sure that they can blend into their atmosphere as well. And <laughs> their uh, little stripes on their face too. Also is almost like a zebra striping look. So it also helps them with their camouflaging. If she's really angry, the cool thing about this bird is the white part of her face where the stripes are, it goes beet red. She turns really red. And that's when I know her behavior that she's gonna be angry and I, I can't touch her because I'll get a bite. So that's really cool. 
Yeah, so um, this is her last nut. If you guys have any questions, please ask me. And then uh, I guess that's it for today with me and Chuba. We do have episodes that air uh, every Tuesdays, Thursdays on our Facebook page. And for anyone looking for fun activities to do, I'm going to send this to Haley. She's the director of this program. You can't have this right now. This is an activity at home, okay? It's called Prey versus Predator. And no, you can't have that. And this is what it's going to look like. So if you guys have goggles at home, it's going to show you how the difference of prey animals versus predator hunt with their super senses of their eyesight. It gives you a better idea why animals on the, like eyes on the side are better to hide and eyes in the front is better to hunt. So that's a fun little activity to do with like your brothers, your sisters, and please throw a, like a soft object at them because one person's going to wear the goggles and throw a soft ball and you're going to try to catch it because what's in front of you when you're doing the prey side is black tape in the corners so you can't see. So your eyes are kind of going to the side. It is very tricky. I know it sounds easy, but I've had a lot of my kids here at the zoo not being able to complete catching something like that when they have the tape on their goggles. So that's a lot of fun. So I will have that sent out to anybody who would like to do that activity at home. Lots of fun. And of course, tomorrow there's a- The Langley Centennial, the Langley Museum. Yeah, kind of a little bit of tongue twister. <laughs> All right, guys, so um, that's it for me and Chuba today. I'm gonna give her a nut. I see that if somebody hasn't seen her and I'm gonna just turn my computer screen. So it was nice seeing you all. I hope to see you again next week and have a great rest of your day, everyone.